up your Bible. Say, this is my Bible. I am what the Bible says I am. I have what it says I have. And I do what it tells me to do. And I love my Bible. So I make this as a confession that I will meditate therein both day and night on a chapter in the morning and a chapter in the evening. And because I do, my life is blessed. No more a mess. No more a mess. Now everything I touch, everything I touch now turns to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, welcome everybody online. Thank you all for being here today in Jesus' name. We're going to have a great time in the Bible, in the Word. Amen. You may be seated. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this, another opportunity to meditate your word. Your word, O oh God, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask that you shine the light of your word to us today by the Holy Spirit. There's a revelation here that we need. There's insight that can revolutionize our thinking and as a result change our lives. We open ourselves to the truth of your word today. Shine your light so bright in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that we not miss it to the right or to the left, that we'll leave blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Turn with me in your Bible, if you would, to the book of Luke chapter 8. You know, I know so many of you, um, you use the overhead projector um, for the scripture, but I really encourage everybody, whether you have your Bible, don't have your Bible, make sure that you take notes so that when you study this week, amen, that you can have a note of all these different scriptures. In Luke chapter 8, there's a story here that the Lord's put upon my heart as the foundation for a new series that we're beginning today. It's in Luke chapter 8, verse 40, all the way through 56. And it says this. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him. And they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue. Jairus fell down at Jesus' feet. Jairus begged Jesus to come to his house. Why? Well, he had a, an only daughter, and she was about 12 years of age. And she was dying. So that explains why he came to Jesus, though he was a ruler of a synagogue. It explains why he fell at his feet and begged him to come to his house. But as he, Jesus, went with Jairus to the house, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman having a flow of blood, something's going wrong in her body, Notice also that this had been going on about as long as this little girl's been alive, 12 years. I want you to imagine what it's like to have something wrong in your body for 12 years. She spent everything she had, her entire livelihood on physicians trying to get better. And she could not be healed by any. Well, she came from behind and touched the border of his garment. He's on his way to minister to Jairus' daughter. She's dying, meaning about to die. She's been sick for a long time. She comes and she touches the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. The Bible says that Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? I want you to also remember that there's an urgent situation here. Jairus' daughter is dying. People are slowing him down. And then now Jesus stops and is asking seemingly irrelevant questions. I don't know if you've ever been in a hurry before. People can irritate you when you're in a hurry. You just stop to get some fast food. 
and they're working with no sense of urgency. So he's having this conversation. Who touched me? Everybody's touching you. Who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touch me, for I perceive that power going out from me. Now the woman, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down. She didn't know if she was in trouble. And she declared to him in the presence of everybody the reason that she touched him. And how she was immediately here. So now we got to listen to this whole story about how many years she's been sick and that she did this. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. My power healed you. No, because I'm the son of God and God can do anything and everything. That's why you got your healing. No, no. Listen to these words. Daughter, be of good cheer. Not my power, not my might, not my spirit, not who I am or whose I am, but your faith has made you well. And then he says, go in peace. While he was still speaking. Someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead. That's some of the worst news that a person could ever get. This is not an older person. This is not his mother. This is not his wife. This is a 12-year-old little girl. And the report is not that she's dying. The report at this point is she's dead. Don't trouble the teacher. Jesus doesn't need to come at this point. She's dead. So we hear Jesus ministering to this woman. He says, your faith has made you well. And as soon as that happened, somebody comes up, we look up, and they're talking to Jairus, They got this look of sadness on their face, and they say, your daughter's dead. When Jesus heard them say that, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only have faith, and she will be made well. Now, I want you to pause, and I want you to take this in. I'm already starting this message different than I did the last one at 8.30. But I really need you to put yourself in this place in Scripture. Jairus is on his way. He's trying to hurry. He gets slowed down. People are taking Jesus away from what he needs to do at the moment. This woman tells her whole story. She gets healed. Jesus says something to her that's really weird. But okay, anyway, we need to go and at that very moment, the thing that I was afraid of was that we wouldn't get there in time. How many of y'all know that's got to be on his mind? He's got to be thinking, if I could just, I know Jesus can perform miracles. I've heard him heal the sick. I know that if I can get him there, that he can heal her. Jesus, would you please come? Yes. Okay, good. Praise God. Oh, man, we're slowing down. Why are we slowing down? Oh, she was dying when I left. It took me time to get here. I'm here, and now it's taking me time. The last thing in the world that I want to happen is that I get home, and I find out that it was too late. It wasn't enough. And sure enough, the very thing that I was afraid of happens. Your daughter's dead. But notice what Jesus said. Immediately, Jesus turns to him and it says, do not be afraid. Only have faith. Now, what's interesting about this is the word believe here comes from the same Greek word derivative of the word that he used moments ago when he said your faith made you well. In the Greek language, the word uh, pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, is, it means faith. So when we see in the Bible faith in the New Testament, it's, it's, the word, it's the word pistis. 
the word believe comes from a derivative of that. It's P-I-S-T-E-U, pistio. It's just like believe and believed. It's another version of the same word. Jesus literally tells him, don't be afraid and have the same thing that I told this woman that brought about a miracle in her life. And as a result of that, you, she's going to be well. Now, I know that's a little bit blind, so we're going to take the next four weeks to open that up. Amen. Do not be afraid. Only believe and she will be made well. Well, what happened? Well, the Bible says here. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, do not weep. She's not dead, but she's sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. And sure enough, he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, little girl, arise. Then he her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they tell no one what had happened. Amen? Amen. I'm beginning a brand new series today called The Opposite Faith. Not the opposite of faith. I want to talk to you about something that I want to call the opposite faith. This is a series that's actually based on Luke chapter 8, verse 40 through 56. I encourage you over the next weeks to read this chapter. When we read our chapters once in the morning, once in the evening, I want you to go there. Imagine being there. Feel what it felt like. Think what they could be thinking about. And I believe as a result, you'll get revelation from the word, even as I have. So I want to talk about the opposite faith. Now, this is not about the opposite of faith. This is the opposite faith, not of faith. The opposite of faith is actually unbelief. Matter of fact, in the Greek language, the word apistis is used for the word unbelief. Just like we put un in front of belief, and that's the opposite of belief. When they put a in front of pistis, it means the opposite. So unbelief is the opposite of faith, but we're not talking about unbelief in this series. We're talking about something that is the opposite faith. This series is about a kind of faith that actually works in opposition to the kind that we should have and that we should use in life. Fear is the opposite faith. I didn't say the opposite of faith. It's a kind of faith in and of itself. And if you're taking notes, then I want you to write down as the title for this part today, a kind of faith. Did you know that fear is a kind of faith? It is the opposite faith. And we're going to find out why it's so important to keep fear out of your life. This series is about seeing fear from a different perspective. So in Luke chapter 8 and verse 50, which is the, the foundation, in the King James Bible, immediately when Jesus heard what was happening, he said to Jairus, fear not, believe only. Fear not. Think about it. He could have said it a bunch, oh, don't worry about it. Don't, you know, I'll take care of this. Oh, she's going to live. He immediately said to her, to him, fear not. Somebody say, fear not. Believe only. In other words, I can take care of this, but it has to be in the absence of fear. 
Because if you allow fear in yourself at this moment, you will be opposing the very thing that will cause the miracle, even the dead being raised to life, from ever happening. Fear works in opposition to faith because it in and of itself is a kind of faith. Wow. Fear not, believe only. Say that with me. Fear not, believe only. That's the goal of this series, is that in your life, no matter what your story is, I am challenging you through this series, is to to live your life free from fear. Because fear in you is a faith that is causing bad to come to you. It literally nullifies believing for good to come. And it's probably one of the most important series that you could ever have and study. Amen? Amen. One of the main reasons why Jesus came is to eradicate fear in your life. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 that for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Think about what was the number one thing that showed up in the garden after Adam and Eve sinned. It was fear. The reason why when they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden, the reason why they hid themselves was because of fear. They were afraid. They were believing that something bad was going to happen to them because of what they did. They were literally having faith in something bad happening. And it's just simply called fear. Well, in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, it's much like 1 John chapter 3, which reveals the purpose for which Jesus came. Watch this in verse 14. The Bible says in Hebrews 2.14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. Now, I need to pause there for a minute because I believe in reading with comprehension. And if you don't know who the children are, who partook of the flesh and the blood, and if you don't know who the he himself is who also took of the flesh and the blood, then you're already lost. Amen? So he's talking, obviously we can read the whole chapter later this week, but in this verse he's talking about us. We are the children of God who live in flesh and blood. And Jesus himself left the glory and the splendors of heaven and partook of flesh and blood. He, come on, he was born of a virgin. He took upon himself the form of a servant, and he was, the the word became flesh, and he dwelled among us. And notice, he did that so that he could redeem us back to himself. So Jesus partook of, he came down on our level. So we're talking about us and Jesus in this verse. Now that we know that, we can read it with understanding. So in, in, in as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise shared in the same. He also put on a flesh and blood body. He, he put on a flesh and blood body. Why? So that through dying on the cross in that flesh and blood body, Man, this is good already. Woo, I got to calm down. Okay, calm down, calm down. The reason why Jesus died on the cross was so that he could destroy the devil who had the power of death. Come on. And that makes perfect sense because 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested. He showed up, and incidentally, he showed up in a flesh and blood body. Why? So that he could destroy the works of the devil. So Hebrews 2 and 14 is a confirmation of 1 John 3 and 8, and, it, you know, it goes both ways. So now that we know he did that so that he could destroy Him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and then watch verse 15. And he also did that 
so that he could release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So what you, what you can say from this verse is one of the main reasons why Jesus came and died was to release you from living a life of fear. What this verse also shows us is that all of us throughout our life have been subject to fear. In one way or another, you know, I, and this is probably true for most guys, I'm not a scary person. I've trained myself over the years not to flinch. It's kind of weird, you know, a dude sitting in the movie, boom. <laughs> Man, there have been a couple of times or two I'm sitting with my wife, you know, and some all of a sudden happens on the movie theater, and I, you know. It just caught me off guard, you know. But then I've trained myself since then. Don't you, don't you be in there, awesome. Somebody jump out of the back, you know, boo, you know. And you just train yourself. Just, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to flinch. I'm, I'm not afraid. And, and, you know, and guys, you know, we harden ourselves to live life that, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a fearful person. I'm not, uh, I'm not a person. I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of a dog. I'm not afraid of a, a robber. I'm, I'm just not afraid. And we harden ourselves. But how many of y'all know the, tr the Bible is true irrespective of what you've conditioned yourself to? If the Bible says that he came to release those who through fear were all their lifetime subject, you've been subject to fear, that whether you have a hard shell or not, fear has affected you all of your life. And he doesn't want you to live in fear of anything. And so he did what he did on the cross. One of the main number one reasons is not through hardening of the heart, but through revelation of the word so that you don't allow fear in your life at all. Why? Because fear is the opposite faith. Fear will work against you while trying to believe God to work for you. You know, when you examine the story of Job, I don't have time to look at it today. I don't know what we'll do in the future. Job lost everything because of fear. He lost all of his children. He lost all of his wealth. He lost almost all of his health. And it was because there was a door opened in his heart through fear. He was afraid that something bad was going to happen to his kids. So he prayed for them and offered sacrifices to God out of fear, not out of faith, out of fear because he believed something bad was going to happen. Matter of fact, there's a statement in Job chapter 3 and verse 25 that's familiar to us. He says here, for the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me and what I dreaded has happened to me. Have you ever been there where the thing that you feared the most would happen happened? That's exactly what I was afraid of. I was afraid that that was going to happen. And for Job, it was his living reality. He was afraid that all of his children would be lost because of their sin. He was afraid of all of his wealth would be lost, that all of his health would be lost. Matter of fact, when Satan went to God to, to, to was, was there, he, he, there was a hedge of protection all around Job and everything that he had. But there was a gap in the hedge. And the gap was there because of fear. All of us have been to that place. If I were to ask you, what are your greatest fears? If you are a person of the word of God, you should realize you can't live this life in fear of anything. The true answer should be, Pastor, I have no fears. Look at Psalm 34. In Psalm 34, 
um, the Bible says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from what? All my fears. As we go through this over the next couple of weeks, I want you to ask yourself, what am I afraid of? What am I afraid of? Because whether you realize it or not, fear in your life is an opposite faith, and it's actually the thing that's causing bad things to happen. I'm afraid of something happening to my kids. I'm afraid of being unhappy in a marriage. I'm afraid of divorce. I'm afraid of ever getting married again because of what happened in the past. I'm afraid that this, this job will never be what I need it to be. I'm afraid of getting in a car accident. I'm afraid. And if you've ever had your home broken into, it's a violation. It's, oh, it's felt. But maybe you're afraid that your home would be broken into. Maybe you're afraid of getting in an accident, or, or maybe you're afraid of flying, or, or maybe you're afraid of, of, of cancer developing at some point in your life and, and, and that you'd end up dying. Maybe you're afraid of a, of a loved one dying because of cancer. Maybe you're, oh, where, where, where are we going with this? You've got to make sure you allow no area of fear in your life. Why? Because it is the opposite faith. By the end of this series, you'll see that the thing that he greatly feared came upon him because he believed it on himself. That the thing he dreaded the most, he actually drew it to himself by dreading it. So let's begin to think about that. What if fear I need the next one, please. What, what if fear, what if it is a kind of faith? What if through fear I actually cause what I really don't want to happen to happen? What if fear empowers Satan the way that faith empowers God. What if fear is believing that something bad will happen the same way that faith is believing that something good will happen? As I get revelation of this, then I will be, as it was where Jesus was concerned, at a place where I, I can't afford to fear. Why? Because I'm opening the door for something bad to come. I cannot fear at all. At this moment, at this juncture, at this season, all I need to do is believe because I need this to come out right. Jesus one day was teaching about the subject of faith. One of the greatest messages, I believe, he taught on faith much. It, you know, faith towards God was one of the main messages of Jesus Christ. One day Jesus was going into the city, and he was hungry. He saw a tree off the road, a fig tree. He went over to see if it had any figs. It wasn't the time, but he just so happened, and maybe it does, even though it's not the time. But how many of y'all know he made a lesson out of this? And I believe it's also why he went over there, because it's so important that his disciples get this. And as a disciple, it's so important for you to understand how faith works. So he goes over. He speaks to this tree. He said it loud enough so his disciples could hear him. He said, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, and his disciples heard him. The story is there in Mark chapter 11. I'm just setting this up. He goes into the city. When they came out of the city, it was night. They didn't have street lights. So they walked by that tree and didn't even know they walked by that tree. You know how it is when it's dark. The next morning, though, they go in, and he was walk walking on by, and almost like he didn't even pay any attention to the tree. But Peter, somebody say, but Peter. He saw the tree, and he called to the master's attention, and he says, Master, look, the tree that you cursed yesterday is dried up by the roots today. Now, that ain't normal. A tree could lose all of its leaves and not be dead. 
right? So in the wintertime, when the tree, the leaves drop, you can't just, well, I got a dead tree, you know, please come cut it out. Well, no, the tree, it's just not the season for leaves. I don't believe when Peter saw that tree that it was just without the leaves. There was some indication because he said that this tree is dried up by the roots. Think about it. Now, there we can go out, and there, there are some trees that you can look at, and you can tell just from certain ev evidences that the tree is dead from the roots. Let me give you some of the indications. The bark is falling off the tree. <laughs> Come on, forget the leaves. Not only there's not a single leaf on this tree, but not only that, the bark is starting to peel back from the tree. Limbs are actually blown or broken off. Why? Because it's brittle, and when the wind blows, it cracks and it breaks. How many of y'all, you could assuredly say, that tree, come on, y'all help me now, that tree is dried up from the roots. I believe something so powerful happened to that tree that it looked like night and day. That tree is dead. Not just the leaves are off of it but it's dead from the root. At that very moment, the very next thing Jesus said when they called his attention, he said to them, have faith in God. I won't be able to get all of this message out to you in one sitting, but I beg you, please come over the next three weeks because I want to teach you that there are different kinds of faith, and fear is a kind of faith. For instance, this scripture says, have faith in God. In the Young's literal translation, he said to them, have faith of God. Another way to say that is to have the God kind of faith. How many of you all know that faith isn't redefined by the Bible. Can you all give me just a little extra time today? I'll say that again. Faith is not redefined by the Bible. When Jesus looked at that mountain and said, if you have faith as the small as a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this man. He wasn't making up a new word. Faith is not a spiritual word. It was a Greek word before Jesus lived on the planet. It was a word in the Hebrew before he ever learned how to talk. But he used this word that people understood, and he described it in the way that they knew not. Oh, man, I'm preaching good today. Understand this. When you came into the room, you sat down in that chair by faith. When you logged on to the computer, you logged on to that computer by faith. When you get in your car after church and put that key in the ignition and turn it, you turn it by faith. When you put a piece of mail in the post slot, Lord, you know you're doing it by faith. And those natural physical acts don't redefine what faith is. But in reality, there are different kinds of faith. I was first exposed to this the, the thought of different kinds of faith by Brother Hagen, and this was probably, I was in college. My mom had sent me a care package, and she sent me two books. One book was called The Human Spirit. It was about how to develop your, your spirit man. And the second book she sent me was called The Real Faith. There were several chapters in that book. One chapter was about two kinds of truth. Another chapter was about two kinds of faith. And then they also talked about the enemies of faith. It's the real faith by Brother Kenneth Hagin. It was the first time I was standing in line believing God for a miracle at financial aid. And so I'm reading a book learning about how faith works. Some of those chapters were about the enemies of faith. And truly, this kind of faith called fear is an enemy of faith. It works in opposition to faith. So watch this. This is powerful. He described two kinds of faith in this book. There's natural human faith, and then there's the God kind of faith. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. In other words, that verse tells us that God used faith when he created the universe. Man, I'm preaching better than y'all are saying amen today. That verse of Scripture, that one verse of Scripture tells us that through faith, everything that we see is not made with things that do appear. 
I know that's a piano. I know that it's likely made of wood and metal and plastic. And yet we see trees. We see iron. We see wherever they get plastic from. <laughs> Comes out of the ground. But what God's word saying is saying that piano was not made by the wood from the tree, the iron from the from the ground, the dirt from the it was made by faith. Now whether your mind gets a hold of that or not, oh, but the reality of it it is true. When he said light be, when he organized the planets and spoke and the the birds and the all of that was created by Faith. Faith created it. So watch this. So there's a kind of faith that God uses, but there's also a kind of faith that you and I use. It's natural human faith. It's what we use. You didn't check the specifications to see if that could hold your weight. You didn't check and see if somebody was pranking you and unscrewed the screws, right? You just sat down expecting it to hold you. Didn't, you didn't check to see if it was damaged. You sat down by faith. That is a natural human faith. And what Jesus was teaching them in Mark chapter 11 is that there is a God kind of faith, a faith that you can speak to a dead situation. <laughs> Whoa, man, this is good. You can speak life in the midst of death and it come to be the way that you declare it. It was in that moment that he was speaking to Jairus. Fear not. Believe only. And she'll live, though she's dead. There's some dead marriages that you are afraid that will end in divorce. Here's the reality. Fear not. Believe only. And that thing can turn. There's some dead businesses. There's some dead dreams. Who am I talking to? Fear not. Believe only. And it'll turn out the right way. All right, a couple more scriptures and then we'll be done. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, for it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. If you are a believer... You're supposed to live life by the God kind of faith, not the human kind and not the opposite kind. Fear is the opposite kind of faith. When I was growing up, I could remember one of my pastors saying that fear is faith in reverse. Another way to say that is fear is faith in the wrong direction. You know, when you go in reverse, that's the opposite direction, right? Fear is faith. That's revelation to me. Amen. And that's what the Lord's given me to minister to you to understand. You cannot give any place for fear in your life because fear is like faith. It is a kind of faith. It will bring bad to you. Fear is faith in the wrong direction. Just like you can believe, how many of y'all believe that God can cause good to happen to you? Well, there's some people that believe that the devil can cause bad to happen to you. And when you believe that the devil can cause bad to happen to you, like you are believing God to cause good, your faith, fear, is working to cause bad to happen to you. You're literally bringing it on yourself. The devil doesn't have any power, but you've got creative power called faith. And if this creative power called faith, which is fear, which is a kind of faith, if you release the creative power of faith, fear, you can cause bad things to happen in your life. All right, we'll work on it. I got three weeks to get it out. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. How many of y'all know fear is not an emotion? Fear is not emotional. It's spiritual. 
Notice the Bible says God has not given you a spirit of fear. Listen, why? Because fear is spiritual. It's not emotional. This is not about jumping at something scary. This is something so much more deeper than that. Fear is a kind of faith. And the last word, verse I give you before we go for today is 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke, we also believe, therefore speak. Notice this. We have the same spirit of faith. Didn't we just talk about the spirit of fear? And now we're talking about the spirit of faith. Guess what? They're in the same class. Fear, this is proof, that fear is a kind of faith. It's in the same classification. It works the same way. If you decide to come back next week because you want to make sure that you are released from fear and that you have no fear in you at all whatsoever, then next week we're going to find out what is fear. Then we're going to find out how do you end up with fear. And then how does fear work? Are you all excited about what's about to happen in us? Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you for being a part of our Facebook Live presentation. We hope to see you next week. God bless you. If you would bow your head with me. If you're here today.